Hey, fanboy nation. This is your pal Daffy Duck, and you're watching. You're watching. We're watching. You're watching fanboy. 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 A fanboy, etc. Fanboy nation. Dot. I assume. Dot. Um. <laughs> Leave it to a Lebanese woman named Lila Mehta to write a movie about war and espionage and everything else, having grown up in a civil war. And, mm -hmm. to, and to be putting in the film herself, Anastasia Anat uh, Anatolia, uh, Lebanese, Mexican, Greek, and uh, a whole hodgepodge of international relations <laughs> just in one person. How are you today, Anastasia? I'm great. How are you? Thank you for having me. Hey, it's great talking to you. You know, from model to actress, uh, yes. you're, fo you're following the path. You know, you just didn't go the Bond girl route like everybody else. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. That's the next movie. Yeah, <laughs> right next one, right next one. So today we're talking about 86 Melrose Avenue. Uh, you know, we're dealing with a lot of espionage, uh, PTSD. The film takes place in an art gallery, no less. So it's good they're prints and not originals. <laughs> right. You know, uh, fill me in uh, on the film itself, your process, your character of Nadia, you know, and how everything developed for you. Wow, where, where should I begin? The beginning. The beginning. Keep it okay. simple. We'll do okay. it chronological. Okay. Um, I had an opportunity to audition for Lily, and I was very excited, actually, that there was a Lebanese story being told, because quite truthfully, you don't really see that in Hollywood. So I was able to get the audition. I went in, and I just felt such a pull to this project. Lily seemed, you know, she was a woman on a mission. She had something to tell that seemingly was from the heart and it was. Um, I think this was, a, you know, had a lot of her personal experience in this film as you uh, already know. And I was just attracted to the film. I was attracted to something that would challenge me, that would put me in a place of uh, such tension and darkness and, um, I was very excited to do it. I auditioned a couple of times. I came to the table reads. I was told I had the part. I was ecstatic. I, you know, I loved the people I worked with. We all became very close um, over the couple of weeks that we shot, maybe two and a half weeks. It was a very intense experience. Um, it wasn't something, I was something I just decided to be all in with because it was just too much of an emotional toll to like, I, I had to just live in that world. I literally couldn't take text messages from anybody. I wasn't talking to people. Like I just decided I'm no longer in my reality. I am in 86 Melrose reality. And that's what happened. Um, and that's just what the movie demanded. Um, so, where should I go from there? Any questions about that? You, you basically used it as an excuse to neglect your husband for a couple of weeks. <laughs> That's hilarious. I shut out the world. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. We'll take us through the shoot. The name itself, 86 Melrose, uh, for people that haven't figured it out yet, is probably the address of the museum. Yes. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, you you have this. You have your own story arc in this. Uh, it wasn't a big six month long shoot, no. but you still get to be fashionable as well. You know, show off your fashion sense as you're going through this. Uh, mm -hmm. When you put yourself in this character, since you basically went method for it, you yeah. know, <laughs> what like do you have personal dramas that you have to have to rely upon? You know, where you had to be. Uh, size double zero for for a fashion shoot and they didn't let you eat for three weeks so like what kind of stuff you gotta go through for that um i didn't have that per se but i actually was held at gunpoint before and i remember and it was a large group of people and i remember the tensity of that i remember you know not knowing if these guys were going to kill somebody or not not knowing if you were going to get out of there so that's actually something I was able just to take myself back to and it's and that sounds possibly severe but it's nothing that I haven't processed um however once that pathway is inside of you you can access that um so yeah that was what personal experience that I brought into that film yeah it's like when the pandemic first hit and people were asking me how is so calm I was like my family is from the middle east we live yeah. in crisis mode this is nothing <laughs> on top of that <laughs> right right 
you know, uh, the your character, you know, you you are multi ethnic. The the cast yeah. is multi ethnic. Uh, yeah. Lawrence Fishburne's son is in the film as well. I was trying yes. to figure out where you know where I knew him from. I was like, God, this guy looks so familiar, and yeah. I can't put my finger on it. And then I see the last name in the credits go Fishburne. Oh, it's Lawrence's son. So yeah, it makes sense. Yes. Did you watch Ant Man? He's in that. Yeah, I didn't. I don't. Remember. Oh, that's right. His son plays the younger version of him in the film as well. Yeah. 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 Okay, so see, there, there's all these tie-ins going back and forth. And it helps when you look like your dad. <laughs> right. Yeah. He's awesome, by the way. Just such a kind, humble person. Very interesting. Yeah. Well, the, the entire cast is interesting. The, the, the film itself, uh, Dede Elza uh, plays Travis. Um, I believe he's the Marine that, that takes everybody hostage, essentially. Right. Um, you know, when, when dealing with that and his character having to come to terms with his own, I prefer the term shell shock, the term that they used in World War I, because yeah. it sounds so much more severe than the initialism of PTSD, where you have to sit there and go post-traumatic stress disorder. Like it, it, sound, it kind of feels like it diminishes the struggle that people are going through with this. And I like- right, I like Because the there's not a lot of post to it, right? Like, You're very much still in the moment. Mm -hmm. And anything can, can trigger that. And, you know, I don't, I don't like the, the phrase, you know, someone is triggered. But in this regard, especially for, for shell shock, you know, a song can make it click. Uh, a smell, a sound, you know, the backfiring of a car or whatever it is, especially with characters like, like Travis, who's a Marine, you know, the littlest thing could set them off. So that plays into it as well. You right. know, uh, when, mm -hmm. when you finally see the final product of the film, what do you notice about it? And the difference between when you're in the moment filming it and now you're pulled back as part of the audience experiencing it in a different manner. Oh, man, when I watched the film, when I've watched the film, it was very much, oh, a drill went off. I'm sorry, I got distracted. When I watched the film, I'm very much pulled back into what was going on with me when I shot it. I can't really watch it as somebody um, seeing it for the first time. Um, again, being in such an intense emotional place, I guess a bit has that memory recall, what was happening at the time, what was going on. Um, so there's that, uh, Dade is incredible and he's the nicest person, like the nicest guy, but he was really just brought an emotionally powerful he was an emotionally powerful force to reckon with. Um, I'm really grateful for his, for what he gave into the film, you know. But it is 90 minutes of intensity. It's not like there's a lot of levity going on in the, in the story. You know, every, everyone's on edge the whole time. You're white knuckling right. it as you're watching going, oh, you know, I need some relief. And right. then, you know, it is what it is throughout, throughout the picture. It uh, hardly comes unless I'm in, you know, the cafe with Rob or, you know, my date with uh, my Avi, Greg, Gregory um, at the end, but there's not much levity at all, no. Uh, when your husband watches the movie back and he sees you, you know, you, meant, you mentioned being held at gunpoint one time. Was he in your life at that point or was this before no, him? This is before him. Does he get to now kind of get a feeling of what you, know, what you experienced that through seeing your performance in the film? Oh, that's such an interesting question. Huh. You know, I'm curious to ask him. Uh, he's, he's got a lot of empathy and I think I've, I've made a point um, cause I, you know, also had rougher experiences growing up. So you talk about those things with your partner a lot. And, and I feel like you talk about them enough to get a sense of where each other is coming from and you're always getting new layers. Um, I feel, I don't know, I'd have to ask him. I, I feel like he probably understands, understood that moment of when I shared that with him, what it was like to be held at gunpoint. Well, we'll see him walk in the shot going through the kitchen behind you in a couple of minutes anyway, because <laughs> spouses always have to make an appearance at some point. No. That kids are pets. <laughs> I actually have him and the cat in the other room. I was like, do not open the door. She'll be right here the whole time. She's, my, our little cat is a mess in the best way. Well, 
Yeah. When you're allergic to them, them like I am, everything's a mess when it comes you to You are? Oh, do you have a dog? No, I don't. I don't, I don't have the time for a pet. And you know, a fish? It'll die in a week on me. <laughs> I, I'll be that guy that buys the $170 exotic fish and then it dies in three days. Oh no. <laughs> that's my that's my luck with the fish. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not I'm kind of like that with plants. I try and I try and I'm just I lack the green thumb, unfortunately. That's because you grew up in Indiana. The snow killed everything. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> What's that transition like from being a kid from Indiana? you know, multi-ethnic kid in Indiana, which people forget that uh, Indiana is also multi-ethnic. You know, they just perceive like one section, one, you know. It very much is in Northwest Indiana. In fact, where I'm from in Michigan City used to be the largest population of Lebanese before it was up in Michigan. Um, What's it? It was, I have an interesting relationship with that place. I mean, it was such, Northwest Indiana is kind of a, a, a place that, had better days, you know, a couple of generations back. Um, I don't know. I take a lot of things that I love from that area. I love the culture as far as it was very music driven. Everybody was playing music or creating music. I come from a family of musicians. Um, I liked. I liked having the multicultural experience. You know. I would, I grew up in a Spanish church, but also for Easter, we, I was in the Arabic church, you know, and I was, uh, I I always, we always had this mashup of cultures. I was so blessed to be able to have looks into different worlds in that way. Um, What else about that place? It gave me a lot of street sensibility, to be honest. Like I was able to leave Growing up over there, I was able to go to New York by myself and LA by myself at very young ages and just survive because I, you know, I learned a lot growing up there. So I wasn't scared to be on my own or be independent in that kind of way. And when you have that experience in real life and then you come to a dramatic film like 86 Melrose Avenue, um, yeah. you know, the, it's like we mentioned, it's a, it's a heavy movie but it's an easier transition in that regard for roles like this and say something that's like a comedy. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I would say so. In fact, drama is, was my main thing. I I really wasn't interested in comedy. I had so much in me that I'd like to uh, express through story and things like that. Um, Comedy is actually, you know, just complete suspension of reality. Um, Although I feel, more drawn to it nowadays uh especially now that life is lighter (laughs) but but that being said drama is still my jam at the end of the day i i I really appreciate stories that allow people to connect to and live live some aspects of themselves out through relate to show them something maybe about themselves in that reflection that they might not have known like i I just love drama and you know, if you could do something like a dramedy, you know, something that's still dramatic, but lighthearted, would that be something that's a bit more interesting at this point? You know, Um, finding the balance between the two? Yeah, I love dark comedies, love dark comedies. I love, I think it's important to find the lightness. And even when, as you, I'm sure know, if, if there's a lot of heaviness around you, people get funnier on the day to day. Like, you know, we start clowning each other, joking on each other. Uh, like there's there's an it's importance to find that comedy even if it's tragic and in fact the more tragic the situation you know the more people find little ways to escape that so dark comedy I really love I love also stories that make really harsh topics palatable more palatable like not you know not necessarily bang you over the head with the tragedy of life because I mean that is life existing is tragic right um so when storytellers or directors can make really heavy topics easy to consume and just like have it up here where people can kind of take it in differently or think about it differently um that's that's really incredible to me and i love that well, like I'll give you an, I'll give you a story that's uh, you know it'd be funny to Middle Eastern people, but it's not funny to like my friends that that don't come from the background. 
Uh, two Easter's ago, my cousin, my cousin calls me up and I was with my mom and he goes, is your mom around? I said, yeah. So I, I put her on speaker and, and everything. And my cousin goes, you know, the, the French school that you went to here in Lebanon, uh, you know, that his daughter was going to at the time, he said, uh, somebody tried to blow it up during Holy Week. <laughs> and we, and we said, oh no, what happened? And he's like, nothing. We're like, what do you mean? Nothing. He's like, well, the kids, you know, the kids and the nuns aren't there because, because it's Holy Week. So everybody's at church. And the guy prematurely detonated, so he blew up the front of the building and himself. So nobody, nobody was hurt. Everybody was fine. And we're like, okay, so what does that mean? He's like, it means they can finally remodel the, the school the way they've been planning for the last 30 years. And we no. were dying when he said it because that's the humor in it for us after everything that's been going on there for so long. And if I tell it to somebody else that doesn't understand, like, how tragic the Civil War was in Lebanon, they look at me and like, they can't believe that we'd find that funny. I mean, it's just, it's pretty comical because it's, it's highly ironic and the whole, like, you know, that's what you get. And then there's a benefit coming from it. I mean, I think that's, that's actually, would be an incredible start of a movie. Like I just saw it so visually that like, that's an incredible story to me. And, it, but it's like, it's funny. It's one of those stories that's funny to us. Yeah. You know? And so with, with that, that's like the, the dark, you know, finding the humor in, in the darkness. Yeah. Um, when you got to meet Lily and, and uh, you know, Lily Meta and, and read her script and, and develop the story, you know, cause usually the writer isn't always as involved, you know, once the, right. once the script is sold, it's like nice knowing you see a later type deal. Right. But, uh, you, she, she wrote the movie, she directed the movie. So it's her baby on top of it. Uh, was she willing to to work around certain things? Because sometimes the director who wrote the picture is so married to the written page. Yeah. That they I'd can't say, escape. I'd say, I say it was pretty much her story. I, w I don't think we tried to change anything up or anything like that. Um, she knew very much what she wanted. And that's just what we gave her. <laughs> She's, you know she's uh she's incredible is it is it easier when it just flows because sometimes you know certain things don't fit the way they're supposed to or you know see let's say you know, was... scene seven was supposed ends up being moved to scene four right. it just fits the flow better oh it fits the flow um wow it's crazy to think back on this because we shot this in 2019 pre-pandemic and the pandemics made everything seem like it was a few years ago. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think. I don't. It feels like it's lasted five years. That's why. Oh my god. Um, I don't. I don't think that we changed the shots any. Not to my knowledge. I remember one time there's a scene where I'm uh, reaching out to Dade when he has us at gunpoint, and there was one line that the only thing I can recall that was changed was she had me change one line out, take one line out about it out because for me where I was at it was impossible for me uh to deliver the line in the moment the way she was kind of asking me to um I I it was there was one clash over one line and then we just ended up losing it because it was just not it was not aligned with what I was bringing to the character but that's all I can really recall with it being such a short shoot, you know, three, four weeks, uh, what is it, like 18 to 28 days, something like that? Yeah. Um, how quickly does the, the story have to progress for you as an actress when you don't have the time to develop that emotional attachment necessarily to the character, but you have to bring it out instantaneously? Is that part of the reason why you had to shut the world out and not be able to respond to text messages or or you know, hey, look at this funny meme. No, 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 I can't do that. You know, it's not to like eight o'clock tonight. You know what? I'd, I'd say so. Um, I get a little obsessive in my work though when I'm creating, I tend to kind of shut the world out anyway. Um, but for this, I would say absolutely. And also I was raised from my jiddo telling me the stories of Lebanon, war, bombs. My jiddo was a barber, uh, for people who don't speak Arabic, <laughs> my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather was a barber in Northwest Indiana and he was also an incredible man. He, you know, was very active. They built the Christian, the Eastern Christian church out there. 
Um, he fought for civil um, against racism and all those things. Anyway, that being said, he would also ha had a barber shop, right? And he and all of the Lebanese, Syrian men, Greek, everybody would go over there. But he'd always come back with these stories of what was happening in the old country, right? And it was just this. I remember being small. And I would take in these stories of where my family was from, what they had come through. Um, and I was just, I remember being so grateful that, you know, they made it here and created a family and an existence in America. I couldn't, so because that was so impactful for me, it was easier for me to get into the park. Was your grandfather Greek Orthodox or Maronite Catholic or? Oh, uh, Maronite Catholic. Or, excuse me, Christian. Okay. Yeah. You know, as, uh, I, my grandmother was Catholic, uh, and she also, you know, had her tales of Mexico and Spain and all those things. And again, like, it didn't seem like, even though America has really rough areas, I mean, Gary, Indiana was like a, the murder capital, right, when I was living there. Um, I still understood that it wasn't... <laughs> Lebanon <laughs> and it wasn't like the parts of Mexico that was ran by drug cartels so you know these are the stories that kept me grateful yeah also yeah. impacted me but it, give, it gives you an interesting perspective on life and then the complaints that people that you know here have you know yeah. I broke a heel I didn't get the purse that I wanted or whatever else in comparison to hey we found water you yeah know? <laughs> like, uh, it is a, it, it's I, I am so grateful for that perspective. I really am. I mean, life is nothing without gratitude, right? And life is nothing without understanding history and the past and what people have come through and how far we've come. Because, you know, we get into this real place of self-hate lately. And, you know, it's easy for our minds to adjust to what we have. It's not easy for and to and to it's probably part of our animal brain, right? To like look for all the flaws and where things could be better, but you also need to stay grateful. I'm going to pick on your grandfather just a little bit. <laughs> how do, how does he end up like in Lebanon, you know, and I and I hear it from uh, from everybody. Uh, in April we can go skiing in the mountain and then we can go <laughs> to the beach 2 hours later. Like, did he just sit there and go, you know what? I'm tired of the Mediterranean. I'm going to go snow all the way. <laughs> like, how does that work? Like, who I comes don't... up the Mediterranean coast and goes, I'm going inland. I'm going to sit know? in a snow-capped <laughs> valley. And that's the end of it. I don't know why they ended up where they did. I just think it was the mass immigration of the time. My grandfather spent a lot of his life here as since he was a kid. So it wasn't really like... You know they were had had the life over there, um, but yeah, I, I it, it's an interesting thing. I remember looking it up, and I was like, "What is a bunch of Middle Easterners doing in middle of America like this? <laughs> like, why here?" <laughs> um, I think uh, I think maybe I don't know if it was like the steel mill attraction or what the industry was at the time. Um, there was a time where our area was rivaling Chicago for like trade like what was going to be the next big city and, and Chicago really took the you know took the cake on that one but I'm not quite sure when that was either so it's, it's all right we all we always have to tease the the older generation just a little bit like, yeah, like why'd you give up a, such a paradise right. kind of like you didn't go to Florida you didn't come to California you or wanna, stay in New York, you right. know. Well, it's too cold in New York anyway, but, you know, like something, you know, like you didn't that's, go, you didn't go that's to the tropical true. Area. I always thought about this because we had the coldest, coldest, coldest winters. And I would just think, my, I'm not made for this. Like, <laughs> this is not where my people come from, you know, not at all. Right. Like I have a bunch of Iraqi friends that ended up in Arizona. I was like, really? Really? Yeah. Arizona of all places, you had to go back to the desert. Like it wasn't enough <laughs> that, that Iraq, because, you know, we're not growing wheat anymore, whatever. Yeah. It's hot. We need, we need heat. So we're just going to go straight to Arizona of all places. Like that's hilarious. You, you could upgrade a little bit. Right. <laughs> right. That is funny. 
So, Anastasia, I, I know we're having fun. We're cracking jokes. You know, the movie 80, 86 Melrose Avenue. Uh, let me double check. Uh, uh, Jeffrey uh, Zarian play, is in the movie with you. Um, you know, he's he's been around for a while. He's older than me substantially. And I'm only going to point that out because he still has a full head of hair. So I have to hate him just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, listen, he would die hair. if he heard you say that. So I just have to hate him just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> He's from LA. He can take a joke. I know. He can, he can. You know? <laughs> I used to see him on KTLA Channel 5 all the time. So it's, it's, oh, it's did okay. You? Yeah, he's, the guy's got a sense of humor. He, he can take a joke on that. You know, <laughs> what's it like working with Jeffrey? Because you know he's got a good sense of humor too. And it's still a heavy movie that he's a part of now. Gregory. What? Gregory. Gregory, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, you know what, I'm gonna get uh, forget it I got his name wrong too just on purpose because again he still has yeah for sure hair. because he's you know he's got hair so yeah. you know um, like if I ever end up in a makeup chair my hair is gonna be there an hour and a half before me because I gotta style it and then put it on no he just wakes up that way the point Gregory, is you know, your hair is beautiful Gregory. Gregory if you're watching this your hair is gorgeous right. gorgeous right. And I'm speaking purely from jealousy. That's jealousy. all it is. It's all jealousy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, Gregory's thing is is a heavy story too. You know, he made yes. he made a movie loosely based on his life a few years ago that was also a heavy story. When when you have cer certain actors and, and people that can go that heavy but still bring levity in, in their life. How much of a joy is it working with somebody like that? Oh my God, let me tell you, I don't know if I could have done the movie without Gregory. I really, uh, he was just my anchor. I mean, I remember, I wasn't going to say this in the interview, but I guess I'm going to now. Um, <laughs> my grandmother actually passed while I was shooting. Yes. And I remember like, I couldn't, I didn't want to tell anybody on set, but Gregory and Gregory was just, I mean, I, I knew I just had to swallow this for a few more days before I can, you know, handle that whole situation. It was awful, but she was in the hospital, all these things happened and it, it was, it was really devastating, but Gregory just was like my light through the darkness in a lot of moments. He was, he's such a caring person. Uh, he's, he's, he was comforting. He was, you know, guiding. He was just, he's just, I, I absolutely love Gregory. He's a great person. Well, so I, I don't know that I could have, I, I think about those things and I was like, man, I don't like, you know, we would go and have lunch in his car and, you know, he was the only person that I had told on what was going on. And, and I was just like, he, he just kind of like kept me kind of safe through the process and the times I needed him to or needed needed it not needed him to but he graciously offered that and yeah he was just such a beacon of light for me right. uh I have to ask you know things are opening up here in California I don't know if you're here or New York uh, California yeah okay. well yeah. welcome home so you actually got the weather that you finally deserve in life <laughs> <laughs> finally <laughs> you know? the hell but we're finally starting to open up. We're in the orange tier, which uh, whatever that means, uh -huh. you know, my friends keep asking me, what does that mean? I said, I don't know, but mm -hmm. you know, the, the colors are getting lighter. So enjoy whatever it means. Right. Uh, <laughs> you know, it is a heavy movie. We've had a heavy year. Why on April 20th, do we need to sit down and watch 86 Melrose Avenue? Because as Californians, most of us will be high and we'll be able to just go for the ride. <laughs> If that works. <laughs> no, I don't know. Um, what the question is? Why would we be watching such a heavy film? It's a heavy film, but we got you know. It is. It's it a good is. film. Don't get me wrong. I mean, we, you know, I'm not going to say, oh, it's heavy. Forget it. No, it's a good film. If it wasn't, I wouldn't be talking to you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. Um, you know, it's a film for. It, I think these films are helpful for people who are a little too contained in whatever they're going through, not in touch with, or kind of refuse um, some of those uncomfortable feelings. And I think this would be a good ride. Um, also just to understand that everybody has their own struggle. I think the film really highlights that and it gives a space for that 
And I love that it tells a Middle Eastern story because I, that was just kind of my own, my own test of how bad life is, how whatever it is, like thinking about those countries that are in such turmoil. So every day is survival. Every day is we live at such comfy lives in America. We live, we have such opportunity here, even though there's things that need to be changed and things we can always do better on. Yes, of course. Um, but, you know, my sister, I, I'm kind of going with my sister, you know, was in the Peace Corps in Africa and like the little that they had. I mean, I don't know. I just think that it's important to keep perspective by understanding the world more, you know? So I think that's a good reason to watch the film. I think it's, it's a good reason to watch the film in the idea of PTSD, which I think is actually kind of, we've had generations and generations of PTSD in America on top of that. Um, and that trickles through families and through family relationships. And it's something to take notice of. I mean, mental health is seemingly, so, is, is becoming more and more of a topic, thank God. Um, and I guess that's the truth of it because every single person in that film is traumatized in one way or the other. And mental health ends up being something that we're all striving for towards the end. And that I think is a beautiful message because that's kind of, if you wanna change the world, change yourself is kind of my perspective on things, you know, kind of work on yourself and better yourself, make, give yourself the tools to love and be lighter and give to others. And uh, so I think that's important. It's, and mental health after a pandemic, it's a good, good little topic. I dig it. I, I, Charlie Chaplin was the one that said, life is a tragedy in close up and a comedy in wide shot. So I love that. <laughs> I love that. Absolutely. And then we've got to give you a little bit of guilt because your sister went to the Peace Corps in Africa and then you went to model for Dolce & Gabbana in Italy. So <laughs> I, I don't know if that's a fair trade-off within the family, but she deserves a better Christmas gift than you do, at least for the next couple <laughs> of years. Probably so. She still is helping people out. She's, an, she's a beautiful little soul. <laughs> Anastasia, where can we find you on social media if we want to connect with you? I am at Stasi Snaps. That's S-T-A-S-I underscore Snaps. Like Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Instagram. I'm not really on Twitter. Um, I'm not on Facebook. I'm I'm not I'm not a big social media person. I try. I, I'll have stories often, but uh, you know I was, I was never great at continuously posting a lot and all those kinds of things but you can find me on instagram you can see my stories i do that a lot so Perfect. what about you what about me are you across the board twitter you have to be right we, we have them across the board but i don't go on to like twitter we post you know obviously the articles and the interviews that, that we do there i just don't have the desire to argue politics with anybody on twitter in 240 characters because i don't think that's a, enough space to do so <laughs> they're very <laughs> ragey on twitter <laughs> i'm a little scared of it <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting old. I just don't care. You yeah. know, two plus two is seven. Sure. <laughs> That's hilarious. You know, it's one of those things. I sometimes will go and see what people will say on Twitter. And then I go through the comments just to see. And I'm like, oh, Jesus, people are so extra. Yeah. The worst is if you actually agree with somebody, but they misspelled something in there. And you're like, I don't think I can like this. Uh, what will it say about me? How will people receive this? That's Anastasia fun. Antonio, thank you so much for your time. Uh, 86 Melrose Avenue is available on VOD April 20th. It's been a pleasure. Please keep in touch and let me know what future projects you have. Such a pleasure. Thank you so much. And just remember, when we finally meet face to face, get the little lint roller thing so I don't get any cat hair on me and like. Have my <laughs> I'm going to make a toupee out of cat hair just for you. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's all, Actually, you're doing it for Jeffrey because I called him Gregory because I'm still jealous of his hair. That's why. <laughs> I'm doing it for Gregory because he called him Jeffrey. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. You too.